We are honored today to have Professor Scott Gartner, the man for all seasons. Uh, he'll be uh, speaking about beginnings, how to start. Uh, this is paired up with uh, tomorrow's lobby exhibit by the fifth years, uh, entitled Beginnings. So, uh, yeah, all right. We, you, you might have a festival crowd, Scott. Oh, tomorrow? No, here. Oh, oh. No <laughs> All right. Um, just uh, one reminder, next Thursday will be the first uh, student guest lecturer. Sarah Gamble from the Uni University of Florida will be speaking. And uh, yeah, so be there in the lobby tomorrow. Check out the thesis work. And also uh, at 4 o'clock, uh, Ben Pinnell will uh, start a conversation about it. So with that, Scott, are you ready? OK. I just wanted to say, you know, uh, if after the lecture, you know, you had a question and I didn't get a chance to address it, or you just want to maybe participate in a conversation about you know, this this topic. Uh, I have a graduate <clears throat> seminar in room 400 on fourth floor of Kogel, and uh, anyone who would like to you know talk about it or listen in is more than welcome to come. Okay. This uh, many of you know Professor Gene Ager, uh, who passed away last year. Uh, he was, for me, a very personal, uh, not only a friend, but a mentor to me and to many, many of Virginia Tech's students and faculty. Uh, I'll be showing a lot of uh, Professor Ager's drawings this afternoon. And so I wanted to show you to whom I was referring when I, when I mentioned Gene or Gene Ager. For several years now, I've been teaching a first-year design lab in Foundation. The first year I taught the class, and every year since, uh, I've noticed a change happening. Usually in the second semester, in the way my students and I spoke with one another about the work, it was as if we were suddenly speaking the same language. Many, as, many of us have had uh, an experience of learning a new language. At first one is, it, as it were, translating one's thoughts uh, from the familiar to the unfamiliar way of speech. There comes a time, though, where the, when this inner translating goes away and one begins to think in the new tongue. Architecture is not literally a language. Architecture is like a language in this way, just as one must begin to think in a new language in order to be fluent in it. Becoming an architect requires one to think in architecture. Consider this passage from Art as Experienced by the American pragmatist philosopher John Dewey. The artist has his problems and thinks as he works, but his thought is more immediately embodied in the object. The artist does his thinking in the very qualitative media he works in, and the terms lie so close to the object that he is producing that they merge directly into it. To anyone who's accustomed um, to this common distinction between thought uh, as an, wait a minute, hold on just a sec. Okay. I'm a little bit messed up here. Okay, fine. To anyone who's accustomed to the common distinction between thought as an activity of the mind and making as one of the body, Dewey's expression, thought immediately embodied in the object, must seem like a contradiction of terms. The sort of embodied thinking Dewey is describing is conspicuously present in the improvisations of jazz musicians such as Sonny Rollins and in the mode of painting in the 1950s that the critic Harold Rosenberg called action painting. So here is a quote from an important essay written by Rosenberg. At a certain moment, the canvas began to appear to one American painter after another as an arena in which to act, rather than as a space in which to reproduce, redesign, analyze, or express an object actual or imagined. What was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. 
The painter no longer approached his easel with an image in his mind. He went up to it with the material in his hand to do something to that other piece of material in front of him. The image would be the result of this encounter. I'm not sure how familiar you are visually with these paintings. I, I always quite enjoyed them. This is uh, Jackson Pollock, probably the best known. I'll just show you a few others in case you might be interested enough to pursue the pursue their art. It's Lou Krasner, Franz Klein. Another painting by Willem de Kooning. And this by Joan Mitchell. An artist, this is another quote again from um, Rosenberg. An artist's sketch is the preliminary form of an image the mind is trying to grasp. To work from sketches, now he's talking about, I had to be trying to make a distinction between architects working in sketches and what I'm talking about. But to work from sketches arouses the suspicion that the artist still regards the canvas as a place where the mind records its contents, rather than itself the mind through which the painter thinks by changing a surface with paint. I mentioned uh, Sonny Rollins. In 1958, the musician and musicologist Gunter Schuller wrote a piece for Jazz Review in which he analyzed an improvised solo by Rollins on the album Blues Colossus. Schuller showed that the piece was a complex and carefully structured piece of music and concluded that it demonstrated an intellectuality that involved the power of reasoning and comprehension as distinguished from purely intuitive emotional outpouring. Rollins himself commented that jazz is not just joy, it's intellectual, makes you use your mind. At other times though, Rollins denied that he was thinking as he played. He described a process in which he began to play variations of well-known motifs before reaching a state in which the optimal condition is not to think. Uh, I just want the music to play itself. If I have to think about what I'm doing, the moment is already gone. <laughs> Reading Schuller's analysis of his playing had an unfortunate effect on Sonny Rollins. People said, I did a certain kind of thing and I began to believe them. And by the time I figured out how I did it, I was unable to achieve the effect anymore. It made me self-conscious about playing, he recalled later, and it took me a while to get over that. In fact, Rollins stopped performing and recording for three years. And during this time, uh, he, was, he lived in New York, he was practicing on the Williamsburg Bridge in New York for up to 16 hours a day uh, before reappearing with a new style of playing. And he recorded a new album called The Bridge now, Schuller reacted to what to Rollins' claim that he didn't think when he played by saying, by God, he is thinking. Now, what kind of thinking that is, is interesting. Here's Sonny Rollins on the, on the bridge. I think both Rollins and Schuller are essentially right in their own way. Schuller analyzed the musical structure of Rollins' playing but he didn't attempt to determine the way in which Rollins achieved this intelligibility in pieces of apparently spontaneous creation. Rollins claimed not to be conscious of this structure as he played, but his notion of self-consciousness seemed to be a sort of standing outside oneself and observing his playing before and as it took place. At the root of this disagreement is the assumption that thinking and making are fundamentally different from one another. Whether expressed as a difference of two substances, mind and body, as in the philosophy of Descartes, or in some more or less well-defined dichotomy, it is assumed that thinking is exclusively an activity of the incorporeal mind or the wet computer uh, of the brain, as it's called in computational theory of cognition, while making is an activity of the corporeal body. 
In Arda's experience, Dewey referred to observations that were made by the Italian, oh, excuse me, the English literary scholar A.C. Bradley, who emphasized this unity or inseparability of poetic matter, content or meaning, we might call it, from poetic form. In other words, the actual words and order and organization in which the poem is written in the imaginative experience of reading. This identity of content and form is the essence of poetry insofar as it is poetry and of all art insofar as it is art. Just as there is music in music, not sound on one side and meaning on the other, but expressive sound, and if you ask what is the meaning, you can only answer by pointing to the sounds. Just as in painting, there is not a meaning plus paint, but a meaning in paint. So in a poem, the true content and the true form neither exist nor can be imagined apart. In all the arts, Bradley concluded, the content is one thing with the form. What, but what Beethoven meant by his symphony and Turner by his picture was not something which you can name, but the picture and the symphony. It is, as Bradley conceded, quite possible to separate content from form by analysis, to decompose their unity in poetic experience, and so consider them as absolute or separate elements of a poem. But he says, these are things in your analytic mind or head, not in the poem, which is experience. And if you want to have the poem again, you cannot find it by adding together these two products of decomposition. There's a portrait of Bradley. So how is a poem composed? Not insisted Bradley by beginning with a preconceived meaning, which is then expressed in poetic form. If the poet already knew exactly what he meant to say, why should he write the poem? The poem would in fact be already written, for only its completion can reveal even to him exactly what he wanted. When he began and while he was at work, he did not possess his meaning, it possessed him. It was not fully, a fully formed soul asking for a body, it was an inchoate or unformed soul in an inchoate body of perhaps two or three vague ideas and a few scattered phrases. The growing of this body into its full stature and perfect shape was the same thing as the gradual self-definition of the meaning. This is the reason why if we insist on asking for the meaning of such a poem, we can only be answered, it means itself. There's a couple of books I Google architecture and language or language of architecture. On the left, you have uh, the language of architecture, which is essentially a kind of lexicon. On the right, the architecture of language, which is a book of poems. These terms, architecture and language, are frequently used metaphors. So it isn't surprising that the two occasionally overlap. But apart from this metaphorical commonplace, are there ways in which we can consider architecture as literally a form of language. This is another quote from Dewey's Art as Experience, because objects of art are expressive, they are a language. Rather, they are many languages. For each art has its own medium, and that medium is especially fitted for one kind of communication. Each medium says something that cannot be uttered as well or as completely in any other language. In fact, each art speaks an idiom that conveys what cannot be said in another language. So more or less what I was talking about at the very beginning. But I would say as well that he's not thinking of architecture, let's say in a current semiotic sense, as a language. Because as analyzed by the sciences of linguistics and semiotics, languages have specific structures and functions Basing their analysis of architecture on the sciences of language, several theorists, particularly 1960, 19, um, 1990, several theorists proposed various systems by which architecture could be shown to encode and communicate meaning as language does. Whatever their shortcomings as all encompassing theories of architectural communication, 
These analyses showed that some of the features and functions of language can be found in architecture and operate to communicate in much the same way. This is probably familiar to you. Most of those who speak of architecture as language are not claiming that architecture is literally a language, nor is expressive in the same way that language is. Instead, a looser analogy of architecture with language as a medium of thought and expression is intended. In this case, the difficulty or impossibility of translating meaning in a full sense from one medium to, into another is, is emphasized particularly that presented by the more complex and refined forms of expression that we find in the arts. I want to talk about now this, what we think of or what we mean when we talk about um, the architectural concept. Because I know that that's something certainly on the minds of, you know, you as you're beginning your projects, particularly thesis students. These are some web pages that I found um, just purporting to you know, explain what an architectural concept is. So what's been said up to this point about the unity of thinking and making or embodied thought obviously conflicts with the general notion of the architectural concept. Just a representative sample of definitions that I found on the internet, quote, a concept in architecture is an idea, thought, or notion that is the main element that drives a design project forward. It is the backbone and foundation of an architectural project. Another quote, the concept as a result of all the readings and analysis by the architects can be defined as an idea, thought, abstraction, philosophy, belief, inspiration, intention theory, or hypothesis. And a third, the architectural concept is the underlying idea conceived as the first step. It guides and holds the project together. Some might even call it the identity of the project altogether. However abstract it may be, it is the role of an architect to beautifully reflect the concept in the design with various elements. Here's another you know, set of concept pages. The one on the far left will sell you a concept for about $50. So if you're you know, having a hard time getting started, I didn't check it out, so I'm not really sure exactly what they're selling, but 50 bucks, you've got a concept. Now, what's been said up to this point about the unity of thinking and making, oh, wait a minute, I already said that. Okay. These definitions are fairly consistent with one another and with what may be presumed, I think, is the general notion of concept in the design process and its relation to architecture. A concept, according to this way of seeing it, is something conceived in the mind. A concept is adapted prior to or very early on in the design process. It regulates and unifies design decisions giving the project an overall coherence. And that's pretty much the consensus of all the pages I've you know, accessed and read. A concept then can be analyzed or abstracted from the work of architecture. I think that a concept of this sort, as it's being described, is really a product of analysis. In other words, of taking apart something that is a whole, of separating the idea from the building, of the building from the material and formal means in which it is realized. My objections to this view are founded or based on my belief that in great works of architecture, we experience a unity of utility, formal order, aesthetic quality, and meaning. This unity is not synthetic. In other words, it's not produced by bringing together disparate and separable 
qualities, systems, or characteristics as though one were running the process of analysis backwards, so to speak. What I think of as the architectural idea or concept in architecture is just this unity. It is the unity of these things. This idea or unity can be conceived only in terms of architecture and experienced only in terms of architecture. It comes into being in the process of design in much the same way as Bradley described uh, the composition of a poem, beginning with two or three vague ideas and a few scattered phrases. Idea is the aim of design. Even when concentrating on specific aspects of a design, the eventual unity of the whole is kept in view and every decision is considered in its relationship to the whole. As this idea or unity emerges, it becomes more apparent as well as more insistent on its realization, truly driving the design process forward. One of the most important readings that has led me to this point of view is Mark Johnson's book, The Body and the Mind, which appeared in 1987. Johnson is currently a professor at the University of Oregon. Together with his frequent collaborator, the cognitive scientist George Lakoff, Johnson's one of the founders of the theory of embodied cognition. Embodied cognition theorists argue that the higher level cognitive functions are grounded in human experience, what's meant by the body in the mind. Our embodied experience of the world presents us with certain patterns and relationships. And these patterns of experience, schema or image schema in the phrase of the theory, structure our cognition. Here's a quote from a fairly accessible article by Johnson, Embodied Meaning of Architecture. Our world is a realm of immediately felt qualities that have meaning for us even before and without language. So thinking of um, the sorts of experiences that Johnson and embodied cognitive theory talk about as being at the basis of our, our further understanding of the world, I've made a, just a set that I think we can all interpret, you know, almost immediately or directly. These are the things of our experience. When we talk about things such as, uh, you know, containment, holding, um, you know, ascending and descending, the body and its feelings in relationship to gravity, movement along a path towards a goal, penetration through a barrier, the portal. The center as both a source and also as the end, away from and towards the center, centrifugal and centripetal force, bodily resistance to gravity, balance, Light is orientation in our world, spatial qualities of light and dark, and space in relation to the body, expansion, contraction, limitation of movement. The point is that these things are the stuff that we design with, the things we think of as we design, and they're not meaningful because they refer to another idea, refer to a concept that is not themselves. They are meaningful in themselves because this is the world we live in with the bodies that we have. Quoting Johnson again, we live in and through our ongoing interaction with environments that are both physical and cultural. However, we also order our environments to enhance meaning in our lives and to open up possibilities 
for deepened and enriched experience. In other words, although we are animals evolved for fitness, we are just as much animals with a deep desire for meaning as part of our attempts to grow and flourish. So what is he talking about meaning? Again, I've ref- hopefully you get a, starting to get a sense of it from the previous slides I showed. The meaning of any object, quality, event, or action is what it points to by way of some experience. Meaning is relational, and the meaning of a certain object would be the possible experiences it affords us, either now, in the past, or in the future, as possibilities. And just a much briefer kind of summation, which I found on a website uh, on YouTube. There's several lectures by Johnson and others. It's very, very accessible. The meaning of something is what it affords in the way of experience. So that leads us to that question. What, what does he mean by affords or affordance? This is a concept that was introduced in the 1960s by the psychologist James J. Gibson. Gibson's ideas were developed in the context of environmental studies. In this context, affordance is everything in the environment that can become a resource for an animal. The animal must be able to perceive the characteristics of objects that make them useful. For people, affordance is some apparent property or quality of an object that makes it useful. For example, you know, the chair is designed to be sat in, but if you need to change a light bulb, you might stand on it. In the context of human development, children learn primarily by exploring and testing the affordances of their world. In the context of architectural design, affordances include intended uses, in other words, design function, but extend to include all the unintended uses that people make of the things in their environment. In all its contexts, affordance is a consequence or an attribute of the physical qualities and characteristics of things. It's not a, it's the thing and its properties that make it affordable. As Gibson put it, the object offers what it does because it is what it is. You know, these are some examples of affordance. And on the right, you have uh, some images of what are called uh, discovery playgrounds. After World War II, uh, a lot of bombed out European cities, uh, many of these cities sort of established playgrounds for children in the bomb sites and essentially allowed them to play and do more or less what they wanted with, you know, cast off materials. Um, we had a professor who's now retired, uh, Professor Hans Rode, who grew up in um, Vienna not long after World War II, and he told me that the city was just filled with these bombed out sites in rubble and he said it was like a child's paradise <laughs> you know, just to be able to, you know, to play and explore and create and do all these sorts of things. Um, there are some in the United States. There's one in Berkeley. There's one that just got established in, I think, Brooklyn. But um, these are some of the, I love the headlines where kids run with scissors and uh, a helicopter parent's nightmare, you know. In other words, it's, it's sort of to allow the kind of exploration with affordance that cre- creates uh, our knowledge of the world. Here's another example from art. This is Pablo Picasso's bull's head. And a quote from him, guess how I made the bull's head? One day, in a pile of objects all jumbled up together, I found an old bicycle seat right next to a rusty set of handlebars. In a flash, they joined together in my mind. The idea of the bull's head came to me before I had a chance to think. All I did was to weld them together. 
But if you were only to see the bull's head and not the bicycle seat and handlebars that form it, the sculpture would lose some of its impact. I couldn't find it, but I read a, I had read somewhere earlier that Picasso commented that you know, one day he hopes uh, somebody will throw this back into the junkyard and somebody will come along and say, wow, that will make a really good handlebar for my bicycle. You know, it's kind of affordance. Um, do we have examples in architecture that we can kind of consider? Well, here's one. The War Memorial Chapel, which was designed by Roy E. Larson and completed in 1960. So consider the many activities that are afforded by Virginia Tech's War Memorial. It offers both solitary and group experience. It's been the site of various sorts of events, such as concerts and weddings, annual Memorial Day observances, and anti-war protests. This is one from April 15, 1970. Uh, if you look close, you might see some of your professors there. Um, any account of the meaning of the memorial must include the intended symbolism of the sculpture, the inscriptions, and the granite cenotaph, as well as the individual and collective memories and meaning that have become associated with it. Another example, you know, right outside our door. Um, on the lower left, you see some, some photographs of what the passage from the lower level up to Kogel Plaza was before it was replaced by this project designed by David Hill of uh, Hill Studio in Roanoke, who is uh, one of our landscape architecture alum. Um, many Virginia Tech architecture and landscape students working for him now. It replaced this mono-functional set of steps with an arrangement of stairs and plantings and ledges that affords multiple activities and sorts of experience. And you can look around and, and, and think of sort of real missed opportunities. I don't have the photograph. You guys know Theater 101 down on Draper or uh, College? And it's right at the end of Draper. You look both ways. You enter it by the set of concrete steps. And you look at that and you think, oh, you know, what could you have done with those steps that would have helped activate that space? And what we have is, again, this mono-functional uh, response to the program. Okay, so these are, uh, I'm going to show you some more of Gene Ager's beautiful drawings. These were tra mostly travel sketches, but he also did uh, studies in Virginia of uh, small towns, mostly in western Virginia. And they, they're scanned from a book called um, D. Eugene Egger, The Paradox of Place in the Line of Sight, which was put together by another of our graduates, Greg uh, Lujan. Beautiful book, and I, I'm sure we have copies in the library. Okay. Embodied cognition theory recognizes that our sensory perception of the world is not passive. We do not merely receive sensory data, which is processed in the mind as has been claimed by a number of philosophers and psychologists and cognitive scientists uh, from John Locke in the 17th century to contemporary believers in the computational model of cognition. You might be interested looking into this writer who I think there's not much talked about today, uh, a German-American psychologist by the name of Rudolf uh, Arnheim. My contention is that the cognitive operations called thinking are not the privilege of mental processes above and beyond perception, but the essential ingredients of perception itself. I'm referring to operations such as active exploration, selection, grasping um, of essential, simplification, abstraction, analysis and synthesis, completion, correction, comparison, problem solving, as well as combining, separating, putting in context. These operations are not the prerogative of any one mental function. 
They are the manner in which the minds of man and animal treat cognitive material at any level. There is no basic difference in this respect between what happens when a person looks at the world directly and when he sits with his eyes closed and thinks. And I put this beside these drawings by Jane Egger because I think you can, you can see this way of thinking as, as you make, as you draw. These are not simply records of the appearance of a thing. They are, they are investigations into this reality um, as he's drawing, as he's seeing. Here's another. Now, by cognitive, again, continuing with Arnheim, I mean all mental operations involved in the receiving, storing, and processing of information. Sensory perception, memory, thinking, learning, etc. And I see no way of withholding the name of thinking from what goes in perception. No thought processes seem to exist that cannot be found to operate, at least in principle, in perception. Visual perception is visual thinking. One of the, one of the points that Dewey was making when he, in that original quotation that I, that I read to you, is that there needs to, you need to be working in a qualitative media, and I'll talk about that in a second, but there's also an immediacy. Now, we as architects are confronted with an issue that the painter and the poet and the dancer are not in that, if you will, the deliverables of our design process are going to be built by other people in other places at other times. What do we work in, however, that does have that potential for thinking in the media? And it is the drawing. Um, and so I've concentrated on sketching the sketch, uh, the qualities of the sketch, trying to make the point that this, this drawing this is a thinking it's not a record of what you have thought a record of what you it, it, it is the thinking itself is happening in the making of the drawing so look at some of these Notice how things get superimposed one on top of the other. You know, he's drawing a view down the street and he begins to think of the relationship of what he's seeing to a plan, to what you would see if you turned 180 degrees or 90 degrees. You know, you, every, every line is the product of this kind of thinking, comparing, putting things together, uh, finding some kind of common commonality that, that allows, that is the understanding of the place. The view on the right, for example, that's no single view. It's, it's, it is this as understood through this way of drawing and thinking. Here are some that were made in Virginia. Uh, communities not far from where we are. He did a b beautiful studies of these small communities. Um, and then later on when I was doing some, some of my own research or looking at small churches, he, he, would all, you know, he, he could direct me and tell me exactly where to go you know, to find all of these. I, I didn't go any place that Gene hadn't been there before being, uh, looking at these things. So that brings us up to a very important word. It, it, it is, what is happening? What are, you, what are you learning? What are you developing through this kind of thinking, drawing? And it's what I would call sensibility. Um, and this is a quote from a writer, uh, theorist Arnold Berliant. It's in a... It's in a contemporary journal, uh, 
Ambiances, the Journal of uh, Sensory Environmental Architecture and Urban Space. And he says it very well. By sensibility, I mean perceptual awareness that is developed, guided, and focused. It is more than simple sensation, more than sense perception. Perhaps one can consider it educated sensation. If we compare it to what Arnheim was saying, um, all perception involves thinking. Uh, by sensibility, we're talking about a cultivated perception, a perception that has been uh, refined, directed, sharpened. And it's something that, you know, these drawings that I'm showing you, I think that, that's the main thing that you, you see in them, you know, that they are seeing the world in a particular way and understanding it through the making of the drawings in a particular way. So we can compare drawings like the ones that Jean made with other drawings. These are two early travel sketches by Louis Kahn. Um, even earlier ones uh, are, are different, even different. Kahn was educated at the University of Pennsylvania when it was largely uh, a Beaux-Arts system-based school and learned many of the very, very traditional techniques of delineation and so forth. By 1951, uh, when he returned to Europe as a fellow of the uh, American Academy in Rome, he had begun to develop through his drawings a very different, a very personal sensibility. You know, one that was acutely aware of and responsive to mass, light, color. I mean, we can compare, let's say, how would Gene have drawn any one of these places? Um, the point is not who's right, obviously. It's what is the drawing telling you about what the, what the architect is aware of? What is the sensibility of the architect, the thinking that is present in the drawing? This is uh, Kahn's traveling sketch kit. Uh, these are called Conte crayons. They are, they're like pastel in the way that you can blend them very beautifully, uh, but they're, they're oil-based, which is why you get that really rich, saturated color in the drawings. And you can see that sensibility you know, emerge in the drawings that he made for his architectural work. These are just a couple of preliminary drawings where he's developing the um, Richards Medical Research Building, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Then the drawing that he, called the definitive drawing, the one where he sort of has reached the point where he now wants to begin to develop the project in a, in a more measured way. Another set of drawings I'd like to show you are those by the Danish architect Jorn Utzen, who's best known, of course, as the architect of the um, Sydney Opera House. In 1966, he published a very hard to get a hold of article, uh, which I still haven't managed, I've only gotten fragments of it, uh, called Platforms and Plateaus, in which he uh, described some of his observations about the architectural ideas of people or that he had encountered in his travels around the world, especially China and Japan and in Mexico. And he was particularly interested in the role that the platform or how the ground is handled plays in their basic understanding or the way that they make architecture. He says Chinese houses and temples owe much of their feeling of firmness and security to the fact 
that they stand on a platform with the same outline as that of the roof. There is magic in the play between roof and platform. You look over at the drawing, and it's as if he's trying to find the quintessential expression of that idea, right? to, 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 to present it so clearly and directly that it becomes unforgettable. It becomes part of the way you think about architecture. The floor in a traditional Japanese house is a delicate bridge-like platform. This Japanese platform is like a tabletop, and you do not walk on a tabletop, even though it might afford it. It is a piece of furniture. Down to two platforms he saw in Mexico, two uh, temp pre-Columbian temples in Mexico. On the left, um, I believe that's a, a, in, Yuc in the Yucatan, a Mayan, Mayan temple. By introducing the platform with its level at the same height as the jungle top, these people had suddenly obtained a new dimension of life, worthy of their devotion to their gods. Suddenly, the jungle roof had been converted into a great open plain. Wow. By this architectural trick, they had completely changed the landscape and supplied their visual life with a greatness corresponding to the greatness of the gods. And then finally, he's uh, Monte Alban in um, Mexico. The mountaintop has been converted into a completely independent thing floating in the air, separated from the earth. And from up there, you can see actually nothing but the sky and the passing clouds, a new planet. These are sketches that Utzon made um, as he was developing the scheme for a church in Copenhagen, the Bagsvord Church, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And again, the, the, in these drawings, the, the idea is so present, so immediately obvious. You know. Then on the left, we start to see the sketch where he's working out the architectural means to achieve something like this. And then on the right, we see the interior views and sections. Yeah. And one more example from his, you know, again, the most famous of his buildings. The three sketches on the left appeared in that article on, um, called Platforms and Plateaus, where he's talking about this ethereal uh, cloud above the level plane, uh, just sort of floating forms above the platform, which which becomes, or these were made after the, the building was designed, but if you look at the right, these are the first two sketches, conceptual sketches that became the Sydney Opera House. So this idea that one can draw to develop or to find a sensibility to think about architecture. I'll show you only a very few of the draw these drawings. These are drawings that I've made over the years. I call them memory drawings in that they are based on memory of a particular place. And very often, you know, I enjoy kind of combining or seeing these things interact with one another. Um, So let's say here, you know, a series of drawings, you know, that take a single, you know, begins with a single kind of idea that I'm interested in, in, in seeing, really, in drawing. And then that begins to develop through multiple, multiple, uh, or a sequence of drawings. Oftentimes, you know, these are sort of worked up in almost you know, very vignette-like particular images which sometimes I will take these into uh, a singular drawing, but also to take them and begin to, again, to create this, this kind of tableau in which you know, the images are individually, let's say 12 individual images that may be drawn from these earlier sketches, but they begin to interact in such a way that they, they start to inform one another or become something 
more than their individual cells. And I want to end up or finish the talk with a sequence of drawings, or should I call them paintings, they're watercolors, that were done by Professor Hunter Pittman. And um, he made these watercolors as part of his master's thesis study in 1989-90. And Hunter, if I say something wrong, shout at me. They evoked his memory of a place, which was uh, some land that belonged to his family in North Carolina, in which he, for his thesis project, was designing a house. In them, the watercolor media made possible afforded, if you will, a way of imagining the place. They are at the same time and in the same form a knowing and a making of the place. And when you, when you look at them, they're basically grouped into three, three groupings, the field, the land, kind of the mountain ridge, and then kind of the reflection of sky and water, if I recall. Yeah. But in their making also, some of just, just the, the particularities of the media began to affect the, the way you're seeing and thinking and making. Mm -hmm. Look at the lower left, you know, where you have, he's in, Hunter's, he, Hunter, is intentionally, you know, allowing two wet, areas of paint to touch and to bleed, you know, which becomes suggestive of you know, the landscape and your perception of it. Overall, there are about 50 of these. And so that's the, that's the last slide, and I hope, I think we've got, you know, certainly some time if anybody wanted to ask or comment. Thank you. Yes. Exactly. So what is the I don't think, well, if we'll scientific linguistics, I don't think they really have a good way to grasp that. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking particularly. Um, what is the connotation of linguistics? Uh, yes, Oh yeah, certainly. Yeah, when I'm talking about language, I don't mean, I'm not talking about the, the, the words that, that we use to describe specific conditions. I mean, we all have to have that. You know? So if you say, well, I'm, I'm, you need to learn the language of architecture in the sense that you understand the meaning, because that's the way we can communicate relatively complex ideas without you know, re rephrasing them every time we have to talk about them. So I think that that's, yeah, essential to you know, the education of architects, if that's what you were asking. Well, we had to go back. It was, I, I enjoyed the conversation because, you know, when we, when we first started talking, you, you know, you, you said, you had said to your students that they must learn the language of design. And I was like, oh my, you're, you're going to not react so well, you know, when I, <laughs> when I talk about this on Thursday. But, you know, I think when, when we started talking, we, we found ourselves agreeing very, very much on what, you know, what that meant and, and what is required of students to begin to, to really think and to work uh, uh, as designers in the case of foundation and then later, of course, as architects. So, 
Yeah, I, th I, th I think, again, the way I've, I've used that phrase, the language of architecture, but basically as a way of talking about this, how every different language or every artistic media affords a certain way of thinking and creating that defies translation, right? And one of the problems is when we, tr when we somehow try to explicate, you know, what, what is architecture? When we talk about what is the architectural idea, well, I don't think I can say it, you know? But I think we can see it. So should we say anything? How do we teach, you know? Well, we can come close. <laughs> I think we try to bring, bring ourselves in the way that we talk about things and to bring you as close as we can. But I believe ultimately there's a kind of leap that has to take place, a jump from a way of thinking to a seeing in, a thinking in, an understanding in architecture that will give you something that cannot be translated out of it. Um, so that, that kind of is a bit of the dilemma in education as well. Now, for those of you who are working, you know, particularly those thesis students beginning your project, you know, I may have said some things that, would, that you would feel you know, unhappy about. I mean, I, I don't think idea in the sense that I'm talking about is something that you begin with. I mean, I think you can have ideas about what you're going to do. You can set a context in which you will work. You can set goals itself. But when it comes down to what makes, what is the architecture in the architecture, the idea is a unity that appears in the making of the thing, in the thing itself, and it's understood through its own self, its own media. You know, and so to me, the place for, let's say, the thesis statement is not at the beginning. It's when you're far enough along where you can take this view outside of it and begin to begin to explicate and formulate parts of it. But I don't think that's the way you should begin. Yes. No, uh, it's, it has its own innateness. Yeah, because what Chomsky's talking about is a kind of underlying universal grammar that um, I think he's probably right. Because the phenomenon, it just observed observations of how children around the world learn language and how quickly they begin to learn it. How they learn it, how quickly it happens. Uh, I think in many ways, language is as instinctual in human beings uh, is maybe, I would just say, I think it's instinctual. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, what, let's say, Johnson and, and Lakoff and others are talking about is that um, the world is a certain way, you know, and our bodies are the way they are in that world. You know, for us, up is not the same as down, and you know, forward and back, the way the way we move through a space, the way we relate in our scale to other things. But they're saying that this this also is something that you know, we we don't begin to you know, we begin to explore it, but it's also and it's also innate in some ways. And I haven't really read as deeply into this, but since these theories began to be proposed and circulated, they've really spread into a lot of places. I mean, I, I, the book came out in 87. There was an earlier book that made a splash in um, literary studies called Metaphors We Live By, which you wrote with George Lakoff. Uh, but since then, you know, uh, you can find this way of thinking in just a lot of different fields, education in particular, uh, art history, theory, uh, philosophy, uh, philosophy, of course, uh, talk, uh, in, in conversation with an uh, English professor who is very interested in Johnson's ideas in relationship to that. Um, but it's also certainly entered into the field of, of brain study. And uh, I can't explain the protocol or exactly how it's done, but they found that some of these 
kind of structures, or they done experiments that indicate that some of these structures that Johnson and Lakoff have described can actually detect it in operation in the brain. Now, again, you know, I can't really comment on that. I think it's something that's really just beginning, and, and you know, it may it may run afoul of <laughs> you know something in the future that will you know you know falsify it. But I but I think for now it's it's a very interesting field, and I and obviously I'm prejudiced for it because. You know, I want a way of thinking that, that valid values and, and validates the way we think, <laughs> you know, the way we make, uh, that, that has at its core uh, a recognition of aesthetic, that our experience, our perception is at the center, that our imaginative thinking is the center of what we are. Uh, I don't like this. To be honest, I'm prejudiced against the the wet computer idea, or that our thinking is somehow disguised computation. Uh, I don't think it is. I think, for example, you know, this is a big problem. Uh, human language, human thinking, uh, symbolic thinking begins as metaphor. And you know, as one of my favorite old, old-timey philosophers, Vika, has said, you know, language begins as poetry begins this imagination, metaphor, that kind of perception of the world. And this is, this is the point, really, that uh, Johnson, and Le in, in, in collaboration with Lakoff, are making. You know, that because we have these particular experiences of the world, because they're common to us, because they're repeatable, uh, we, we then see things that are not directly <laughs> experienced in those terms. And it, the first book that came out in 1980 pointed out just how, how our language is just, how we can hardly think about things without using metaphor. Of course, the, the, the issue is that after a while, the metaphor simply becomes so commonplace that you know, it's, it's very denotated. I mean, th just, just give you one example from that book that really struck me. We think of time as a spatial construct. I said, what? How, how's that? It's in our, the, in the coming days, for example, right? Well, time is an abstraction. It's not coming or going. It doesn't have any kind of spatial character at all. But how can we think of that without, in some way, having something to gra literally ground it in, you know, to give it some meaning to us so that we can talk about things that are not directly experienced or perceived? You know? So we might think of, Time or, 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 or the passage of time, for example. Again, that's another metaphor. I walk along a path. You know, the past is behind me. The future is in front of me, so to speak. Again, these are, this is the way we think. And the, a point I wanted to make is that if, if you take this seriously, both, both Johnson, Lakoff, and... Um, Ornheim, architectural thought is not, or the kind of artistic thought that Dewey was talking about, Bradley talking about, that's not a special case of human thinking. That's the way we think, right? It's developed in a certain way in the arts. But ultimately, the same things you might be able to say about that, you could say about the way we, we commonly think and go about our lives. Uh, just a word on, on uh, affordance. I just think it's so much richer for us to think in those terms than in terms of function. You know, we tend to think of function, at least on naive levels, a kind of straight line. Form follows function, although that's, I could get into what Sullivan really meant by that, but that's another, another lecture. What, if you think about it, what um, affordance is telling you is that no, function follows form. We find use for the things as they are in the world. And I, yeah, I, I think that is an infinitely richer way of thinking about what we do and how people use it. Any, any other? Okay, thank you. And again, if, if, you, if you do want to follow up or have a question, please feel free to come up to 400.